make sure. Okay, Marie, when did you start drawing as a kid? I don't remember. It was very young because everybody in the house drew. So we always had paper. It was the Depression, and for somehow my parents always had stuff for us to draw, and we never had to turn it over and do it on the other side either. So we were middle-class Depression. <laughs> did you do any formal art training? Well, um, yeah, I, I went to cartoonist and illustrator school, but that was not like uh, high-class stuff. Uh, I think I, I had what I thought was adequate at the time uh, at home because my father was a painter. He was a package designer in, in real life. I had been signed up to go to Pratt Institute, and my brother John was going to pay for that. But I said, heck, I want to go out and earn money. I would, you know. So uh, I got a job down on Wall Street, and then when John was working uh, at EC, they were dissatisfied with the coloring. When the company ended up folding and Mad stayed on, it's a black and white book, what'd you do? Well, I thought Mad would never last. I could have stayed there, but you know, how could it last? They're gonna run out of humor. They don't have Harvey anymore. What are they gonna do? And I was basically a colorist at that point. I wasn't doing that much art. Uh, I wasn't selling any art. And uh, so I went up to Stan Lee, worked for Stan Lee until he folded up because the censoring got so bad that you couldn't even have a gun going off on a Western cover or on a, somebody chasing somebody in a terrible graveyard with uh, some guy running up after somebody or, or a lady screaming with her dress maybe above her, her knee or something. The censor would come right down. Now, Al Feldstein maintains that the, the other publishers, this was a, a scheme solely by them. I think it was also political. I think Keith Offer was a great help in getting that, making a name for himself. And also the publisher, the other publishers were, were all for it. But I can't see that the publisher would because they were getting censored too. I mean, it went up to Stan Lee and we couldn't do anything, you know? And it wasn't that we didn't want to do bad things. It was that, you know, uh, for the action of it, that's what a kid wants is, is excitement. And they took that all away. Uh, Marvel was called Timely at that point. They went under and they fired the whole bullpen. And everybody went their certain ways, except the key artists like Severin Manili, Bill Everett was there. I think they did freelance then. And of course, they, they never really went out of uh, those guys, the real fast and professional and good styles. They always seemed to survive a bit. But I was always very un un uh, bitter because so many of these guys came home from, from the war and stuff and their lives had been interrupted. And then they're working, trying hard, paying off houses, just getting married. And they, they, their, their business is wiped out. And I thought, these scrounges that did this. And today, when you look back at what was done, all our stories had a good moral. They were, they were comical. They were like grim fairy tales. The humor stuff was superb. There was nothing off color with any of that stuff. Bill will tell you, Willie will tell you the story of his Santa Claus story. I mean, it's, it's classic humor. It's wonderful. And what he added... Uh, was fabulous. Was Joe Manilia in Atlas when you were there? Yes. Delightful. It? Yeah, really. I had a crush on him, too. I had a crush on Graham Engels. Had one on Johnny Craig. It's okay now because they're older. See, I can tell. And, and then Joe Manilia. Oh, he was great. People have told me that, that Stan and Joe had a great relationship. But insofar as you pick the guy that you relate easiest to when you're doing the most with, like Stan Lee did later on with John Romita. You know, John wasn't the fastest one in the world, but he did exactly what Stan wanted. He did the kind of women he wanted. He told the kind of story. He was accurate. He was slow, but he could interpret what Stan wanted easily, and he didn't give him a hard time. And I think Manili and Stan got along that way, too. I didn't think of Joe as an art director. I don't think, Stan was always the art director, but I mean, like, maybe Joe was the one that he would call upon for something that he wanted to get across his own way, maybe. Well, he certainly did a lot of the covers in those. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's fast. Books. Joe was incredibly fast. If he lived, then there might not have been all the Kirby characters that came out of that. I don't know. I think Stan uh, knew how to use people. My brother and, and Joe got along very well. They would enjoy doing the war stuff together, and they would switch pages back and forth, covers back and forth. Nobody knew, you know, so what are you doing in? Well, I want to do that with you. No, no, okay. They sat together, you know, and go out to lunch together and stuff. So you left DC and you, and you went through all that stuff and then you segued into the Marvel and then this whole revival of superheroes. I worked for a little while at the Federal Reserve Bank and put out a comic book for them and at a film strip place, a film strip on mythology and I was told my work looked too much like a comic book and <laughs> it was a good story. It was Pandora's box. You should have seen what I had coming out of that box. And then I was doing art then. I was really into it then. And then I went to stands to see if I could get some freelance because I left that film strip place. They were, they were going out of business too. So uh, I never got out the door. I was there for 30 years.
Stan didn't even look at my portfolio, put me on production right away, and then later on there was a opportunity. They wanted the Kirby art for a thing in Esquire magazine on the drugs in college. Saul Brodsky, the production manager, said, we can't spare Kirby on something like that. Send Maria, or maybe she could handle it. I got five pages in Esquire magazine. When it came out, Mr. Goodman said, what is she doing, doing paste up in production? And then I got artwork. And but I wasn't pushy. I didn't have to support a family. I was living at home at the time, so I was no competition to the guys. It was only later on when I was an old lady and the young kids came in and we also had royalties, so there was a lot of competition for money. Some of it was personal because, you know, guys, what does a woman want to do this stuff for? And the woman didn't really care that much about men that looked like they were deformed and women who looked like they were drawn by men who know not woman. You know? <laughs> <laughs> My stuff was never that wacky, but uh, the superheroes were okay. I think I told a good story. It's, it's interesting. There weren't that many women in. in no, Ramona and myself and a couple like uh, Tarpy Mills. Yes, yes. Stanley was a riot. He, he was a riot. So into it, so creative, and he knew how to tap your head too. When I worked for Stan Lee in the '60s, Stan would would show. I want the fellow to come at you like this. You know, and, and <laughs> yeah. but that's part of the whole deal in comics. The best kinds are people who get into it, really into it. So uh, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. And they call him Smiley. He was absolutely charming. The women love him. You know, but he was good too. I like working with Stan very much.